We are beginning to get feedback from across the globe about um, this teaching. And I think in order for us to do justice, we might need at some point to allow for questions, especially if you are dealing with peculiar cases, uh, we will be open to that. God bless you in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you, choir, for your ministration. Hallelujah. All right, turn your Bible quickly to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. You know, yesterday I said that the first thing that is required uh, to set up a personal altar is that the human attendant must make a commitment, must sustain a determination, must make a vow except there is something somewhat of commitment involved, you are not likely to stand and to last the test of time. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, several men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we, somebody read verse 4 with me. Let's read it as a congregation. But we will give ourselves continually. Now, it means that they were trained, adequately trained for ministry by Jesus. Some things began to rise up in the congregation that is suggestive of an emergency, as legitimate as the issues that came up where these guys were not willing to stop doing the business of ministry to attend to the emergency. Are you with me? You are not following me. You are not with me. Do you realize that their commitment to prayer, their commitment to prayer, was somewhat of a vow because there was a legitimate matter that was coming to draw their attention. And this matter, though very legitimate, was not able to secure their attention because they have made a commitment that the description of their life will be prayer and the ministry of the world. If they are saying we'll give ourselves to prayer, if they are saying we'll give ourselves to the ministry of the world, what they are saying is that prayer is going to shape us. We submit ourselves to the process and the protocol of prayer to the end that our lives and our ministries will be shaped by prayer and will be shaped by what? The ministry of the world. Once upon a time, a group of senior ministers invited me to be one among them. In my own mind, I'm not a senior minister, but these people are senior ministers. And they extended an invitation to me to join their ranks. Part of what we do is that the beginning of every year, we gather somewhere to pray all night. It is in that meeting that insight into what the year holds and all of that are discussed so that just in case you didn't have personal encounters, you'll be able to borrow encounters from that meeting to set yourself in alignment. 
Are you there? So the um, the meeting is early in the year. So we have done that of this year. We now went for this year's meeting. And then the eldest among the elders now stood up. He gave us a working definition of what it means to be a minister of the gospel. And according to him, a minister is someone that is prostrate before the altar of God. That's the description of what we have in the book of Acts chapter 6, verse 4. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the world. So if you are in ministry and it seems as though there is no breakthrough coming your way, we need to ask you a question. Is it true that you have given yourself continually, continually to prayer? Is it true that you have given yourself continually to the ministry of the world? Can you see what we're trying to describe yesterday? This is more than a commitment. This is, this is a vow. This one, he said, this is the way my life is going to run. It will run by prayer and it will run by attending to the word of God. When you sustain this posture, this posture of deciding that there is nothing the kingdom of darkness throws at you that will be strong enough to interfere with your commitment by the altar. If you arrive at that point, it means that you have registered sufficient evidence that you want to do business with God. The resultant effect of that heart posture is that God secures an appointment to meet with you. Like I told you yesterday, this appointment thing that we are talking about is based on God's calendar. If we go to the book of Psalms chapter 8, give me Psalms chapter 8 on the board. Psalms chapter 8. Hallelujah. Psalms chapter 8. To the chief musician upon get it, the Psalm of David, O Lord, our Lord. How excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou, hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest it? The reason why I read this scripture to us is because of the word visit. That it is in the nature of God to visit his people. And this scripture is from the Old Testament. I have a New Testament scripture that supports the same idea. Are you still with me? Okay, maybe we may need to check the book of Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. Are you there? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 24. God had made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. You know, the other time we defined praise as God's, God's food. God's food. It means that God needs your praise to survive. You are wrong. You are so damn wrong. Because we believe that, okay, it's when we bring praise to God, it adds to the sense of his being. You don't understand that God existed in eternity without you and me, and it was fine. The first time he had a challenge, the first time in his history, where he experienced rejection was when he created you and me. 
The Bible says he's not worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything seen. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. Hallelujah. Next verse there. And had made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And has determined the time before appointed. Now, we need another translation for that scripture. The King James makes it too complex to comprehend. Yes, what, what? from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise. Ah, no. Give me another translation. Starting from scratch. He made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time. Jesus Christ. <laughs> there are some translations of the Bible we need to throw away permanently. What, what, what was that? Oh, all right. This is okay. And he made from one common origin, one source, one blood, all nations of men to settle on the face of the earth, having definitely determined their allotted period of time and the fixed boundaries of their habitation, their settlements, lands, and abodes. Can you, can you see that? God, there are two elements of the manifestation of God's sovereignty in this scripture. The first element is that God preordained our time before appointed. That's King James English. The meaning of that big presentation is God preordained our times of visitation. It means that it's in the nature of God to want to visit human beings. That is in the nature of God. So the moment you set up an altar and you have a commitment to keep coming, to keep coming, to keep coming, what you are doing is that you are registering yourself for an appointment with God. And since it is the nature of God to visit his people, God is going to set up a, a moment, a window of visitation in his calendar to attend to you. The validity of your altar, the proof, that your altar is making sense in the realm of the spirit is that it secures a response from God. And I'm telling you that the moment you begin to make this unbroken, undying commitment, undying commitment to reach God in the place of prayer, and it's a consistent aspect of your daily existence, what you are doing is that you are registering for an appointment with God. And because it is in the nature of God to set up appointments and times of visitations for humankind. If you notice, God was always coming to visit Adam. It's in God's nature to visit humankind. And he's more desperate to occasion a visitation to an individual that is making effort to reach out to him. God will consummate your effort by occasioning an encounter by occasioning a visitation. Is that clear? So you can see the orientation of the apostles. He said, we'll give ourselves continually to prayer. <laughs> we'll give ourselves continually to the ministry of the word. So if you are a minister of the gospel here, you have been sentenced to prayer. The prayer altar, like that elder said in that meeting that I was part of, he said, the place of the minister is before the altar. I know in this congregation we have medical doctors and uh, of all sorts, of all kinds. We have professionals in different fields. But the way of the minister is before the altar. And these guys knew this because Jesus trained them. Jesus educated them to understand what it means to be in business with an entity that is a spirit being. If you are going to collide with him again and again, 
it must be because you have taken an oath, you have sustained a determination that you will give yourself continually to prayer. And like I told you, I know you are desperate to encounter God, you are desperate to hear from God, you are desperate to see God, you are desperate to, to encounter Him and all of that. But God, God, God is equally desperate to meet you. However, the moment He begins to notice that you are making a very sincere effort to connect with Him, He schedules an appointment with you in His own calendar. God is busy. So he sees that you're making effort. Are you following? So he will schedule you on his busy calendar. He will make space for you. Unfortunately, he doesn't tell you when the appointment is. It's your ability to tie that will make you collide with the appointment time. I was outside about to enter my car yesterday, and a lady cried out. Oh, I'm from so-so place in Lagos. You came here without an appointment, and you are expecting that I will see you. Are you not aware that the governor of Benue State is in this town? Why didn't you see him? You would have said, oh, we just branched over. We, we passed by. You cannot see a serious person, someone that is preoccupied with responsibilities. You cannot see that person without an appointment. Are you there? You can't see. And it's not pride. The man is already busy. If you are not going, if, are you there? His table is full already. So if he's going to make a moment available for you, it will be by appointment. In this little level of ministry that I've done till now, this small one, I can tell you that 24 hours is not enough for me. Because medically, there's a prescription of how many hours I should sleep. If I have a plan to live long, and I assure you, I plan to be around for some time. Are you there? You see, you don't go and marry, and then you won't have time for your wife. So having time for your wife is also part of your 24 hours. Don't think that we just pray and fast and say, hey, Holy Ghost, come down, Holy Ghost. No, we are balanced. We are balanced people. All the important things that I need to do in, in one day, 24 hours, is limited for me to accomplish it. To even do a very good Bible study, a very good Bible study, and you take one scripture, just one verse of scripture, and you see that that verse of scripture is fragmented into four sections. You need to stop studying and go and stroll around the heart first and think about it. Because what it means to meditate is to think, think loud enough for you to say what you are thinking. What is my meditation? Think loud enough for you to say what you are thinking. When you begin to think loud enough for you to begin to say the things that you are thinking, are you there? The Holy Spirit will hop upon your mind and bring you to a point where you begin to think his thoughts. So that scripture that you gave the Holy Ghost the opportunity to begin to think, what he will do because you are thinking on the scriptures is that he will include his thoughts in your thoughts so that you think beyond the boundaries and the powers of your own thoughts into his thoughts. That is how you gain understanding of scripture. So in order for me to crack one verse of scripture, for your information, he's the one that gave me Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse 4, as the first to continue with. He said, that thing you were trying, you were struggling to communicate yesterday. See it here. It was during my meditation that he came to me and said, hey, you were struggling. You were struggling. You were struggling. See, take this scripture. Ah, then he occurred to me, oh my God, why didn't I find this scripture yesterday? Meditation. Are you there? So, when I do that for one verse, for two verses, for three verses, I've almost gone, four hours is almost gone. Just meditating on four verses. 
so that the Holy Spirit can think his thoughts into my thoughts. And then when I come to teach you, I teach you from the world of the thoughts of the Holy Ghost that I have transgressed into during my time of meditation. Four hours, gone. And if you ask me, how many scriptures have I worked on? I say, just four verses. And you think I'm lazy. You don't know. Scripture is not just length and breadth. Scripture is depth. And forever, you will never see the end of that depth. If you have done business in deep waters, you will understand what I'm talking about. I can preach from one verse. I will do it maybe one of these days. I will stay on one verse for 15 days so that you will know that there is, you can't touch the depth of Scripture. As long as I can meditate, then the Scriptures will always come fresh. So, you, there's no time in the 24 hours for me to make a location. So somebody starts traveling from Lagos, and the person's personal intention is that he has appointment. That is a spiritual appointment. He believes there's an appointment. And then the person lands him according. You don't, you don't do like that if you are looking for a job. Why should you do, do that with me in the equation? That yes, I'm going there and I will see you. The, I will clear your doubt. The, it's outside, we'll be talking. Oh, you are, you are welcome, you are welcome, you are welcome. Then I will drive off. By the time I do it three days, for three days, you will not ask, how do they see people here? Are you there? You are not, you are not following in my own opinion, that person that travels is not ready for an appointment yet. Because the person is not ready to follow the protocol for appointments that we have laid down. In view of the fact that my table is full. So the moment you begin to make effort in the place of prayer, what God does is that he sets an appointment for you. In the eyes of God, if you are desperate enough, if you are serious enough, you should be able to tarry sufficiently to meet with this my appointment. That is the reason why God will not tell you the day he will encounter you. There are few times when he may, he may do that, but most of the time he doesn't do that. He's expecting you to tarry until you are endued with power from on high. So a few times in scripture he might come to Moses and say, Tell, those, tell the children of Israel to wash their clothes, to purify themselves today and tomorrow because on the third day I will visit. There are some times that he, he can tell you when he will come. Most times he doesn't. So those of us that were in the, in the lecture yesterday, you saw in the book of Luke chapter 24 how Jesus said it is time for him to release the promise of his father but that they should go to Jerusalem and tarry until they are endued with power from on high. So it means that if you continue in the journey of priesthood, you will encounter God. The day, are you there? The day of your encounter with God is the day that you meet the supervising spirit of your altar. Now, the second point about raising a personal altar is interfacing with the supervising spirit of your altar. Interfacing. You are praying, you are praying, you are praying, you are praying, you are fasting, you are calling, praying, you are praying. Forget about the days of your prayer and the days of your fasting. The objective of your prayer is for you to encounter God. So the second aspect of priesthood, the second aspect of, of, of setting up a personal altar is your encounter, your interfacing with the supervising spirit of your altar. I need to explain that. Are you still, are you still there? The day when the spirit being that you have been pursuing decides to come and respond to your call, your priesthood has shifted. You know, before the supervising spirit of your altar comes, you are the ones that determines the sacrifice that you are putting in.
to encounter God. You are the one that determines the reading, determines the number of hours, determines the prayer points, determines everything. But the moment the supervising spirit of your altar comes, he comes with his own demands. The demands that he desires that you should be pressing into. Not your own demands, but his own demands. And it's, prayer points are good, you know. A lot of us have prayer points for the new year. You hope to exhaust these 14 prayer points that you have generated so that you can move the hand of God in that direction. I wish you well. But you see, experience has taught me that the moment the supervising spirit of your altar comes, he will, he will, he will prescribe for you his own prayer points. And your own prayer points, as powerful as they, they are, may not see the light of day if this supervising spirit comes. The supervising spirit of your altar gives you a prescription of how your priesthood should look like from the perspective of what he desires, not from the perspective of what you are doing or what you desire. Oh, you are not with me. All right, let me show you um, a few scriptures, a few scriptures. Genesis chapter 31. Then I'll read verse number 13. Genesis chapter 31, verse number 13. Are you still with me? Okay. Oh, 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 wait, wait. 13 is just spot on on the scripture. Let me give you a little background so that you will understand what this encounter is about. Are you there? I say, are you there? Okay. All right, can we begin? Let me start from verse 1. I just want you to understand the story, understand the context, understand the progression, and then follow, follow in the revelation of Scripture. The core of altar practice is what I'm about to show you. The core, the epicenter of maintaining an altar is what I'm about to show you now. All right, Genesis chapter 31, verse 1. And he heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob had taken away all that our fathers, all that was our fathers, and of that which was our fathers, had he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return to the land of thy fathers and thy kindred. And I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and lay her to the field unto his flock and said unto them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And ye know that with all my power I have served your father. And your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring strict. Thus God had taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me and it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream 
And behold, the ram which leaped upon the cattle were ring streaks speckled and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I say here, I, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring streaked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Liban do it unto thee. God was speaking to him, and in verse 13, we had an executive introduction. So he was introduced to the person that was talking. I am the God of Bethel. This is the supervising spirit. But you see, he linked his identity to a covenant and altar, a pillar that Jacob had raised previously. I am the God of Bethel. Where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. The altar that he raised, the supervising spirit of that altar came to visit with him according to the appointment that God has secured concerning him. Guess the first thing that the God of his altar told him. He said, Arise, get thee out from this land and return to the land of thy kindred. Now, I'd like us to analyze the tone of the supervising spirit. Is that the tone of a friend? Somebody needs to answer me. Is that the tone of a colleague? Is that the tone of an acquaintance? the tone with which your, your supervising spirit will come is the tone of a king, the tone of a governor, the tone of a master. The first thing he reveals about Jacob is that Jacob was in the wrong location. How many of you realize that if you are in the wrong location, we should not be asking you how much speed you are, you are moving with? We should don't be talking of speed when you are displaced. And there was no way he could know that his time in his father-in-law's house was accomplished, if not through the wisdom of the supervising spirit of his altar. As wise as you are, you have a PhD, you have a master's degree, and I respect your effort and your academic attainment. You will need something more than the calculus that you did, the circle geometry that you did during masters in mathematics to know what direction to take in keeping with your God or the destiny. The supervising spirit of his altar appeared and told him that he was lost, told him that he was displaced, that his destiny cannot be fulfilled in that land wherein he finds himself. He will need to go to a location that can support his destiny. Hey. Hey. And there was no other way he could know this reality except when he encountered the supervising spirit of his altar. The, the spirit you are calling. And the reason why I'm calling it supervising spirit in a general term, general terminology, is because people that have witchcraft altars also have supervising spirits that come to visit them. It, this, what I'm saying is, it's a general application thing. It's just that in our own case, the supervising spirit happens to be the Holy Ghost. Whenever the Holy Ghost comes into your space, it comes into your space, and the, the, the utterance it brings into your spirit is suggestive of the fact that he is your master, your Adonai, your governor. It is at that point that your work with God starts. Your work with God has not yet started until you have met face to face with the supervising spirit of your altar. When you meet with him, he begins to regulate your life according to his own wisdom, according to his own terms, according to his own scale. And that's why 
anyone that is in the labor of the gospel, all right, that has maintained his own parameters, his own wisdom, his own way, <laughs> excuse me, that person has not met the God of the Bible. He doesn't have a functional altar. That's the reason why he could maintain his own style all along. Because when the supervising spirit of your altar shows up, it takes charge. It takes control. Your life will now be regulated under his supervision. Oh my God. Oh my God. I know what it means to be supervised. I know what it means. I know what it means. And you know, it happens to be that in marriage, if you don't have a supervising spirit, you will shipwreck your marriage. Because both of you are two different individuals. And you're, in most cases, your perspective of what is right and wrong is likely to be different because you people have different orientation. And that is not supposed to be a disadvantage if you have a supervising spirit. Because it now operates as an umpire that will regulate your own life. And within the scope of his reg regulation, his will will begin to prosper. His kingdom will begin to come. His intent will begin to find expression. Are you still with me? All right. One of those days, I had an opinion. My wife had a different opinion. All right? So, and normally, my... My PowerPoints, you know what I mean by PowerPoints, are the likely places where I'm going to hear God. One of them is the shower. Hallelujah. I'm not saying you, I'm talking about my own. This is my own story. This is my son. Are you there? The shower. So when that incident took place, in order for... I use wisdom. I... I looked at the way the matter was, and I, I agreed with it. And, hey, this thing, mm. even though it was, is not, is contrary to my own wisdom. Um, I said, mm, okay, okay, okay. Then I went to take my bath to prepare for the program in the evening, because if I say I want to argue, 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 the anointing I've gathered through prayer, it will leak out. So I agreed. I said, oh, okay, this is, this is okay. Yeah, glory to God. Hallelujah. Then I entered into the shower to take my bath. And then God, my supervising spirit showed up. You know what he told me? Any price you pay for peace in your home is wisdom. Meanwhile, are you there? <laughs> oh, let me, let me, let, you need, you can, you can benefit from my encounters too. He said, any price you pay for peace in your home is wisdom. Paying that price is wisdom. Meanwhile, before I went to the, to the bathroom, I, the plan was, let us just agree now so that I can go and preach. Then when I come back, I can disagree. I say, yeah. <laughs> See, I was here, you were saying something. You were saying something. You were saying, yeah. So, but when I got to the bathroom, there was no need to come back with it for a rematch because the supervising spirit, are you there? Ah. Marital life is going to be very difficult if one of the members lack the supervising spirit. However, if you have a supervising spirit over your life, I want to tell you that there is no situation that it will not give you wisdom on how to survive. The reason for wisdom, wisdom, is because humankind is limited. And there are challenges that come up that you may not have any know-how to tackle it. That's why wisdom is needed. Do you understand that? And I know you know this. Wisdom is a spirit. Wisdom is the Holy Ghost. Wisdom is a person. Wisdom is Jesus. So in wisdom, we are reaching into the heart of Jesus to get the strategy to contain the situation and to conquer the situation. 
And you must understand that this wisdom is beyond your human level. It goes beyond your human thought, your human thinking. It can be secured from the heart of God. So, in my mind, let us submit now and then go and have a good time because I know that if there's challenge, anointing will not flow. So, let's submit. But there was no need for return leg because the supervising spirit came and said, any price you pay for peace is what? Is wisdom. Long ago. A certain minister of the gospel felt that uh, attempting to discredit me was his ministry. So I didn't know how to, to respond to that situation because all the options that I wanted to explore were bad options. Have you been in a situation where all the strategies of solving it are bad? All of them are bad. There's no good option of all the options that are available. So that was the kind of situation that it was. So I now decided to approach God about it. When I approached God, you know what he told me? He says, stand still and you shall see the salvation of God for the Egyptians that you see today, you will see them no more forever. That means this problem you are passing through is very temporal that you can decide to ignore it. It will solve itself. Very temporal. So I kept quiet. I pretended as if I was a fool. And the problem solved itself. There was no action, humanly speaking, that I, had take, that I would have taken that would have been right. I analyzed it. I hope you know by now that I'm a good analyzer. Analyze it from this side, analyze it from this side. At the end of the day, I, know that, or I knew that there was nothing that I did that would be considered right in the eyes of someone that is an observer. And the supervising spirit of my altar knew much more than that. He knew the solution out of the problem. Most of the time when the devil comes your way, what he does is that he stirs you up. He wants you to act in the flesh. And the moment you act in the flesh, you give him a foothold. He now has a legal, legal right to be a member of your family. Satan has a legal right to be a member of your family. And there, there are some dimensions of fleshly manifestations that a pastor can, can go into. And Satan will not have a legal right to be a member of the ministry. That means you will need to cope with Satan. How many of you remember the scripture that I read about Zechariah that was standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan was standing to resist him? The scenario of that event was before the throne of God. And God was seated, and Satan did not lose grip from Zechariah. Oh, you are not here. You would think that, okay, when Satan sees God, you will run. What gave Satan the empowerment to stand there? It wasn't God that gave him the empowerment. It was Zechariah. And as long as anything has to do with Zechariah, Satan has a valid ground to stand in the space. I've seen all kinds of manifestations of the flesh that have given Satan the empowerment to stand in churches as a church member. To stand in families as a family member. And like I told you the other day, if you see Satan around, he has a threefold agenda to accomplish. He came to steal, he came to kill, and he came to destroy. You might see him putting on spectacles. He's not about to it's not a selfie. It's not posing for a picture. He is looking for a way to kill you. That is actually is tuning his eyes to find occasion. It's not photograph he wants to take. He wants to kill. The day you become serious about life, you will become desperate 
to ensure that you close the door to Satan. And trust me, you are not wise enough. You will need someone wiser than you. This guy's life would have wasted. In the book of Genesis chapter 31, verse 13, Jacob's life would have wasted in the house of labor. If not that, his supervising spirit came and said, go back to the land of your fathers. Go back to the land of your fathers. I entered into Benue Hotel here for three days. I was fasting. I was praying. I was fasting. I was praying. Only Philip, my friend, and my wife knew that where I was. People were going to my house looking for me. Hey, we have come. Oh. We have come. I was not there. I was in Benue Hotel. I was fasting. I knew God wanted to speak to me, but he, he would not speak to me. So I remained there. I did fasting and prayer for three days, and God did not speak. And I only had three days, so I had to pack my things to go back to work. Pack my... Have you ever been there before? You finish dry fasting and nothing came out. <laughs> so you just carry your, your bag and say, <laughs> Die will be done. Die will be done. Hey, that's how I left the place. I said, well, I came to look for you. You are busy. I will come again. And I took my bag, took everything, and left the place. I was now in transit. When I was in transit from Makodi, as I was going, he came through the window and sat in the car. I said, when is your passport expiring? He said, my passport will expire on the 28th of September 2020. He said, your job also expires that day. Then he, he, he jumped from that seat through the window, and he left. I said, who says this kind of thing? I was two weeks away to write the exam that would qualify me to be a manager. The letter was out, for God's sake. I was looking for you three days. You would have come. If this is the news you want to break to me, you would have come first and say, how are you there? <laughs> Do you know what? He doesn't come as a colleague. He come as Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. And you know what? His voice was so clear, I could not mistake that it was God that spoke. And that was why I turned in my resignation on the fifth day of October, 2020. Are you there? What he was telling me was the kind of thing that he told Jacob. Arise. Get thee out from this land and return to the land of thy kindred. So that was how I submitted that application. Most of my relatives did not like the decision. But no one wanted to be in that position of telling me not to submit to because they know I will submit. So no need to tell him. Now he will now submit. Then when he prospers, because he submitted, you will now become the person that looks like Satan. So nobody wants to be in that position. My, I had gotten a promotion. My salary was more than a million naira. I was doing well. And if I had had the additional promotion, oh my God. If I wake up and I stretch my leg, it will stretch. <laughs> so I now went back to God. I, I told God, I said, would it not be in your interest, to your glory, that a manager is your son? A manager in this my office. The people that have been there before, they don't know you. See the havoc they created. See, see the way we suffer. Because we walked under people that, ah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why not allow your son to become a manager? The system is going to benefit from the goodwill that you will spread abroad the entire place. You know, mm, do you know all this my talk, he didn't answer. Because he's not like you. He's not your friend. 
He comes to establish government in your life. In the eyes of heaven, listen to me. In the eyes of heaven. In the eyes of heaven. You know why the first kingdom message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Because in the eyes of heaven, the only thing that humankind is very good at is to rebel against God. And in order for man to identify with the kingdom of God and the government of God and the reign of heaven, he will need to repent from his nature of rebellion. And accept a nature of submission in order for the government and the reign of God to prosper in his life. Somebody say from rebellion. Uh, you know the reason why it's hard for you to say it. I know why. I know why. I know why. I say say from rebellion, from rebellion. To, submission. to submission. Adam modeled the example of rebellion in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus modeled the example of submission. So when the supervising spirit of your altar comes, in order for you to cooperate with him effectively, you will need to submit to his will and keep your intelligence behind. You know, I told you that it's when he starts encountering you that your work with God begins. You begin to understand God's heart. God's desires. Through the instructions he gives you, you begin to see his, understand his desires, understand his heart, understand his ways, understand his dynamics. I wanted to take an opportunity to allow us to study a typical case. A typical case of the nation of Israel and the supervising spirit of the altar that Moses managed. You will see the instructions that God gave. I want to, I want to show you a parallel through, through, through some chapters of the Bible so that you will have an insight into the fact that when the supervising spirit of your altar comes, it comes to establish government over your life. That's when you lose the handle of control over your destiny. That is when he becomes your God. For, for some of us sitting here, you are still your God. And you are guilty of idolatry. Because your will is superior to the will of God in your life. It means your work with God has not yet started. You may be born again, but you have not started working with God. You have not started dealing with God. All right, let's take, let's take a few scriptures and do the proper analysis. If you go to the book of Exodus, because in the book of Exodus, are you there? Moses was managing a national altar. The encounters about how to set up an altars on a national scale, those encounters were given to Moses. I want you to see the efforts of the supervising spirit of that national altar and the instructions that came from that spirit under various circumstances and under various situations. Your work with God begins when your supervising spirit comes. Exodus chapter 12. Let's begin from chapter, chapter 12 because that's where the Passover, the Passover and all the attendant instructions that were associated with the Passover came. Are you there? And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this is the supervising spirit speaking. I'd like us to take note of the instructions he gave. Because when he comes into your life, he comes to run your life. A priest is a man that has accepted the governing power 
of the spirit being that he contacts through his altar. If you have not accepted the governing power of your supervising spirit, you are not yet a priest. Because what makes you a priest is that you begin to learn the ways of that spirit being. And I told you the other day that a spiritual sacrifice is making available something that is pleasing in the sight of a spirit being. When you make available something that is pleasing in the sight of a spirit being, the spirit being will be willing to defend you, will be willing to protect you, will be willing to give you an advantage, will be willing to advance your cause. If someone stands up and the person wants to contend with you, the spirit being will say, hey, if this man is cut off, it means the things he does to please me, there'll be nobody left to do it. So the spirit being will rise up in your defense. That's a proof that you have a God. Do you, do you realize that it's not everybody that can be killed? Hey! For, for some, the moment you are thinking about killing a man, then you die. Yes, you, you, you would have lived longer. Maybe you would have even reached old age if you were not nurturing such thoughts. That, it is trespass already. You know, are you there? Are you there? Do you still remember how God went to threaten Pharaoh because he wanted to compromise Abraham's wife? In fact, God told him, as you are now, you are dead, you are dead already. When you have a God, he fights for you. Are you there? I've been in the office before, and people wanted to deal with me. I went to God. I said, this one, the way I started that kind of prayer is, is this man relevant to you? Is he in your agenda? I start that way. Maybe the man who has a stake in the kingdom of God, so it might be, my request might be difficult. Is, is he in your agenda? Is he relevant? The moment I get a feedback on that, I can displace you. And indeed, I've displaced many men for your information. I'm good at it. I'm good at it. I'm good at it. A friend of mine married into a royal family. And they wanted his wife to come and perform some rituals because she's a part of that family. He ran to me. And I told him, uh, go and sleep. I will take over this matter. And he still couldn't. I told him, sleep, 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 sleep. I will take over this one. I, I know God a little. And I know how to take advantage of my knowledge of God. Do you know? The, the affliction that came into that royal family made them leave my friend alone. And that is what we mean when we say we, are, we move the hand of God. So I will show you some techniques, but I will not show you all. I will show you, so that you will learn, learn, learn your own. I will show you some techniques on how to move. When you know that a man knows the order, he knows priesthood, he knows it, leave him alone. It will not end well. It will, it, it will not end well. It will not end well. What I'm teaching you are things that we have seen and things that we have practiced. Okay. Now, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto the, to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, take to them, they shall take to them every man a lamb, According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. This is the day the word of wisdom came on how they will manipulate the visitation of the angel of death. The decree was given in heaven. And the angel of death was dispatched to Egypt. 
to go and kill every firstborn. But through priesthood, Moses was in touch with the same God that gave the decree. And then he was able to extract a wisdom from God on how Egypt, Israel could be exempted from the sentence of death that was proclaimed on the firstborn of Egypt. And the wisdom was that they should take a ram, slaughter that ram, put the blood of that ram on their lintel, put it on their doorpost. In the night, when the angel of death came, in the eyes of the angel of death, the firstborn of the Israelites in Goshen had already died. Someone helped him with the assignment in Goshen. And that was why he went over Goshen and began to slaughter from every house in the greater land of Egypt. Are you there? Are you with me? That was the first instruction. This instruction was a directive. And as many as obeyed the directive, they were kept from danger. Some of the instructions that your supervising spirit will give you is designed to make you escape something that is bigger than you. Oh God, I have seen that it is not every time you need to fight. Sometimes God is aware that you are not strong enough to encounter that enemy. So he gives you a wisdom on how to escape his presence. That was what happened in the land of Goshen. Should I tell you something? One of the evidences that you have a supervising spirit is that he will deliver you from enemies that are stronger than you. Verse 13. Are you there in verse 13? Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. Put it on the dashboard. Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn whatsoever, who, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both man and all beast, it is mine. Do you realize? Are you there? You are not following me. You are not following me. Do you realize that because of the word of wisdom that was applied, all the firstborn of Goshen were spared and the angel of death did not take their lives. The next instruction was that all of those people that enjoyed my wisdom and have been spared. All of them should be dedicated unto me. I'm talking about the supervising spirit of the altar of Israel. Uh, should I say something quickly? In the New Testament, it happens to be that all of us are first born. And that's why the Bible calls it the church of the first born. The first born are those that that blood made an escape route for them in Egypt so that in exchange, there was an exchange that took place. Instead of them to die, it was the ram that died. Is that clear? Now, in, for us, in redemption, it was you and me that was supposed to die. And it was the blood of Jesus that made an escape for us. It means that we occupy the status of firstborn. And the requirement for Firstborn is that firstborn must be consecrated to God. All firstborn are his. So the first thing we see that the supervising spirit did was that it made a way for their deliverance. And then in the very next chapter, he now requested that those people that were delivered by reason of the blood should be consecrated unto God that they are his. Do you realize that when the supervising spirit comes, this is the basis upon which he comes to exercise government over your life? Because on the basis of your redemption, your status as it is 
at this moment is that you are his. Your priesthood and the altar that you set up, seeking to meet him, seeking to encounter him, seeking to see his face, is an attempt from your own end, saying that, I understand that I belong to you. I understand that I'm your property. Uh, at least come and take your property. Come, see me. He will come. Because you are speaking out of knowledge. Your prayers is based on revelation. Come to your property. I've come to submit what is yours to you. God is always excited when you consecrate yourself to him. When you tell him that others can do this, me, I cannot do it because I belong to you. It is only that which you command that will I will do. Can you see that you cannot separate priesthood from your life of consecration? You cannot separate priesthood from your life of holiness. Because that's the prescription of life that it makes available for you to walk in so that nothing can accuse you. Nothing can, can, can have a legal entry into your space because you are separated completely to serve his will. So the second thing we are seeing that the supervising spirit demanded from that nation was that those that benefited from that blood should be dedicated to him because they become his from that day. Are you still ready for us to continue? Yes, you will see that from one dimension to the other dimension, he begins to exercise government. He begins to exercise rulership. He begins to make their life his own idea and not their own idea. Come with me. Let's do verse. Are you still there? Okay. Now, do you realize that in that verse 13, are you there? Verse 13. After he requested that all those firstborn should be submitted to him because they are his. He paid for them using the price of that blood, so they are his. He paid for you using the, the blood of Jesus. That's your bride price. But he will not ask for you. He will not demand anything from you. You will be the one that will take yourself and submit to him. As long as you are unwilling to submit to him, he will not take that which is rightfully his. But you cannot practice priesthood if you do not, first of all, come to that realization that you belong to him and you are willing to allow him to take his possession. And when he takes his possession, he will only instruct you to do that which is pleasing to him, that which is his will for you, that which is his design for you. If you live that kind of life, you are living out his will, doing his plan, fulfilling his desire. Satan will have no occasion on your life. There's no legal ground. There's no premise for Satan to exercise his authority. And more and more, your life is going to begin to reflect the things that are captured in the promises of God. Are you there? You will see the things that God promised those that walk with him. They will begin to reflect in your life. And Abraham is the typical example of the master of the altar. Typical example. And at the time of Abraham's old age, the Bible revealed that God had blessed him in every single way. Anything you can call a blessing among men, God had done that to Abraham. Just because he worked with God. If you, if you consider children a blessing, he had them. If you consider financial um, blessings to be a blessing, he had it. If you consider influence to be a blessing, he had it. And he did not have it because he walked with the devil. He had it because he walked with God. Are you still with me? The Holy Ghost is the greater one that is in you. And if you can follow his leadership, he will make you great. That is, that is certain. And the examples of our ancestors are here in the Bible to guarantee that. Do you notice that after he asked for those children to be consecrated unto him, the next thing that he institutes is the Feast of Unliving Bread. I'm still in Exodus chapter 13. 
Now, these feasts that God commanded are times and seasons of national worship. Like corporate worship. So seasonally, just like we do contacts every month, and everybody comes, we worship, we hear God speak to us through his word, we make commitments to him in the spirit. God likes those seasonal corporate worships. So he himself instituted them. The first, it was after he demanded the consecration of the firstborn that he went ahead to also institute a feast. The feast of unleavened bread. Okay. Let me show you the New Testament meaning because I know you know that feast from Old Testament perspective. And the entire Old Testament, the Bible says, is a shadow of good things to come. The meaning of the Old Testament is not the Old Testament. The meaning of the Old Testament is what God is pointing to by the drama that he's carrying out in the Old Testament. It's prophetic in nature. And our understanding of what God is doing is the meaning of the Old Testament. So we must not stop at studying the Old Testament. We must know what it is pointing to. In the case of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it is pointing to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. If you have it, you put it on the dashboard. I, I want you to know that this is a prescription. This is a prescription from the supervising spirit. If I had time, I'll take you through the entire book of Exodus, and you will see the prescriptions that God gave a people that were under his hand. There was no aspect of their sociology that God did not prescribe. God did not recommend how he wanted them to live along those lines. His government was supposed to affect every aspect of their lives. So the government of God, when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom, it affects every aspect of human life. The way you relate with your wife, that gospel, it affects it. Because the government of God has a prescription for how you should relate with your wife. The government of God has a prescription for how you should relate with, with authorities, political power and authorities. The government of God has a prescription of how every aspect of your life will be lived so that your life will be without blame and Satan will not be able to find any occasion against your life. If your life cannot be blamed, you are in a position to influence things by the power of God and the power of Satan will not be able to influence you. But if your life can be blamed, you can do that crusade and come back. And when you come back, you are going to be under attack. Because there's a premise, Satan has a foothold in your life. A call to the life of holiness is a call to a life of immunity. Because Satan will not have any entry point to influence your destiny. Are you there? Now, he said, therefore, let us keep the feasts, not with the old living. He's talking about the feast of unleavened bread. So let us keep that feast, not with the old living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness. Are you still with me? Or you are not following? God institutes the feast of unleavened bread. That's the first feast he institutes. After he demands for the consecration of the firstborn, then he now institutes a feast. And the meaning of the feast is that we can no longer travel with malice. We can no longer travel with wickedness. Because when we say Unleavened bread. We are talking about unleavened bread of sincerity and what? Truth. Now, you see, the more you walk according to the prescription, 
of your supervising spirit, the more impossible it will be for Satan to find an occasion to attack you. And even if, if he does, because he doesn't operate by the rule, you can bind him and he will recognize the authority because he has nothing in you. Are you there? So as he calls us to consecration, he calls us to leave every part of wickedness whatsoever. He calls us to purge ourselves from malice against anybody. And we shall function with sincerity. And we shall function with truth. Let me show you another scripture. The golden scripture of priesthood in the New Testament. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Is it? Amen. First Peter chapter 2, sorry, not chapter 1. First Peter chapter 2. And I'd like you to see the progression from First Peter chapter 2. It said, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile. You should recognize malice there. He said, laying aside all malice, all guile, all deceit, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. This is a migration towards purity, sincerity, and truth. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. So what is the meaning of sincere milk? That's the truth. The naked truth. Pattern your life after the truth that is revealed in the word of God. Are you there? That he may grow thereby. Let the fertilizer that will make you grow become the truth of the word of God that is in the Bible. He said, desire it so that it will become the instrument and the propeller that will occasion your growth. If so be that ye have tested that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen by God and precious. He gives us the example of Jesus. That human beings discredited him. Are you there? But he knew in the privacy of his heart that he had been true to God. And God will always make public that which is true before his face in the secret. So even though men disallowed him, huh? he was chosen of God and he is precious. The next verse, which is verse 5, is the verse of priesthood. Can you see that he started from a journey into purity? Migrating from malice. Migrating from Wickedness. Migrating from evil speaking. Do not answer evil with evil. You can actually overcome evil with good. Oh, a relative of yours. He tortured you while you were growing up. He didn't see any good thing that will come out of your life. Now God has helped you. And his own child needs help. He doesn't even have the courage to approach you because he has a very good record of how he treated you. The Bible says overcome evil with good. You can adopt that as child. For you to prove to him that I'm not like you. When you are prayed that way, I hope you know, you adopting him to train him, you have killed warfare in that family. Because if you refuse to train him, he will not go to school. He is likely to end up with a leku. <laughs> and then he will tell the leku spirit that the reason why I'm like this is because I had an uncle that refused to train me. So now all his children, 
make them useless. Aleku, 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 aleku. Make them useless. That fight will become transgenerational, but you can overcome that fight and blot it out by refusing to respond like a wicked man. He said, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You've heard my story. Should I tell the story again? You know it too many times. Let me stop. Are you there? Overcome evil with good. So there's a migration. There's a migration. No more malice. No more evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God. Do you see the words, wordings that were used? Compare them with 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. You will notice it's the same thing. In order for you to function effectively on your altar, there is a demand for you to perpetually migrate, to become like God. It's a desire. The truth of God in its purest state exists in the Bible. Give the Bible and the Word of God as revealed in this book the authority to regulate your life. That's what he said. Until you become so sincere. There's no wickedness in you. When you call on God, He will answer you. When you call on Jehovah, He will hear your voice. So we have 10 minutes. I want us to call Him. You see, it's not far away. No, I didn't finish this lecture, but. I know you already have an idea of what I'm talking about. When he comes, he comes to regulate you. Your willingness to allow him to regulate your life is a proof that you have begun a walk with him. A walk with him. A walk with him. And he shall die. He shall die. Elohim and Adonai It's your age You're still the same By the power of your name Eshada Eshada Elohim and I don't. Can you forgive that person that hurt you? Just forgive. Use five minutes to forgive. Release the person. If you are going to maintain your personal altar, you cannot do it with malice. You cannot do it with bitterness. You cannot do it with wickedness. So release that person. Release that person. Release that person from your heart. Release the person. If you can successfully release that person, then we'll pray for five minutes and you will see that God will answer us. Someone treated you badly. Someone was unjust to you. Someone subjected you. To a terrible experience. We don't want to allow that experience to hinder. What God. Wants to do. In your life. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, God. Can I pray a prayer? All right. Father, we have forgiven you. 
by forgiving them that have treated us badly. We have released them from our hearts. We have released them so that our work with you can be clearer. So that we can draw help from your presence. If it is true that you have heard us, then in the lives of those that you have refused to visit for a long time because of the malice, because of the bitterness, because of the things that have accumulated in their heart and have constituted a blockage to your presence. Can it please you tonight, oh God, to return with your presence to those lives, to return with your glory to those lives, to return with your mercy on those lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask, oh God, look kindly on your people and let your presence be restored. The presence of God is coming back to someone here. It's coming back to your vessel. It's clothing you afresh just because you let go. Oh, it's stronger. Stronger on you. There's a renewal taking place already. There is a refreshing that is taking place already. He is bringing you pulling you out of the swamp pulling you out he's pulling you out already Woo! there's someone in the congregation God is beginning to clear the way around your spiritual senses so that your perception can be healed Father heal the perception Heal the perception in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. 